throughout its history, Russia has annexed foreign lands, colonizing indigenous peoples, destroying their national identity, then using the same very nations to seize new territories and enslave other nations. As we'll see today in the 21st century, the methods that the Kremlin used almost 500 years ago just do not change. And it does not matter what the state is called. Ancient Moscovia, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation, the essence remains the same. Today, just as in the past, other enslaved peoples, the Sahayakuts, who have been under the Moscow occupation for almost 500 years, give their lives for the imperial ambitions of the Kremlin, apparently completely forgetting how the several centuries ago the Muscovites killed their ancestors and annexed their homelands. And then, after the annexation, those who survived it were forced to forget the atrocities of the Kremlin. The history was rewritten, cultural heritage destroyed, their very lives repressed. Mobilization was done quite harshly, which meant many were taken away in the middle of the night from shopping centers, from their workplaces, from the street. Helicopters were sent to our village and at 4-5 o'clock in the morning, many were taken away from homes that happened to them absolutely unexpectedly, so that a person had no chance to react properly to the situation. There were numerous protests in Yakutsk. Probably the Republic of Sakha has never experienced such protests and riots at all. Obviously, it is the question of the extermination of a people. It turns out they use colonized peoples as cannon fodder against peoples that had been colonized formerly, but have risen and started fighting for their independence. This is following the same policy the Kremlin has been using against our peoples for four centuries already. We are colonies. We were colonized 400 years ago. There was no voluntary joining the Russian Empire. We are talking about the fact that our lands, as well as our people, were seized by means of violence against the will of people living in those territories. And we are demanding justice to be restored. We will create the future Yakut elite, composed of people who are ready to fight and stand for freedom. Get ready, the time when we have gained our independence back is coming. After the announcement made by the President of the Russian Federation on the mobilization throughout the country, including the Republic of Sakha Yakutia, people have been massively taken away by the military registration and enlistment officers in order to be sent to the criminal war in Ukraine. They were taken away from the homes, from the educational institutions, right from the streets. The mobilization was announced in September, but no one in the Republic of Saha in general really expected such a turn. That was the reason why a lot of people got confused, scared of the mobilization. They did not want to participate in this war because they did not understand what for. I felt completely numb. No one took in what was happening. They simply could not believe their eyes, even though all the time they have been told they would be taken soon, that the war would come to their houses. Mobilization was done quite harshly. Many were taken away in the middle of the night from shopping centers, from workplaces, from the streets. In the majority of cases, those were one-day actions. They took away men, did not give them any time for preparation, maybe gave three hours to get ready, or just brought them to the military registration and enlistment office. They say that up to 20 thousand of men were taken. Somebody gives more down to earth numbers, from 7 to 10 thousand of people. They started from the regions, from the villages with population of 300 people, taking away 30, 40, 50, 70 active men who were involved in such activities that the whole village depended on. In fact, these are villages with no internet, so basically people did not understand where they were going, where this Ukraine is, the land that they should be protecting. 
вертолеты в нашей деревне. They sent helicopters to our villages and at 4 or 5 in the morning they were taking people from home. That happened absolutely unexpectedly so that a person had no chance to react properly, could not fight back. Needless to say it is terrible. When we had fires and the whole republic was choking, the Kremlin sent helicopters to Turkey to put out fires, but not to us. Right now when they need to mobilize men to send them to the war, they found helicopters and all the necessary equipment. They said that mobilization was only for those who did military service, who were in reserve, but that was a blatant lie. They took out the fathers of large families, disabled people, or those who were not suitable for their age, drove them to the gathering points. They just took men out in such a way. Later at night, planes full of men flew away. They were sent to Ukraine in this way. The reaction was drastically negative and manifested itself in numerous protests in the city of Yakutsk. The Republic of Saha has probably never seen such protests and riots before. Actually, our first protest occurred on September the 25th. We organized it through social networks. We gave very detailed instructions and also provided legal information on how to defend themselves during the arrest and such like. About 500 Hundred six hundred women came out to Orjonikidze Square and danced the national Saha dance or Sukhai. They shouted such slogans as "No war, no genocide, no mobilization." <laughs> There were a lot of detentions. During the first protest, 24 women were arrested. During the second one, 24 more. And they were arrested all around the city, on the streets, in the pharmacies, at the bus stops. It was a real nightmare. <laughs> A week after that we announced a new protest, but it never happened due to the plane with the Rose Guardians sent from Moscow. This was telling and we realized that the authorities are really scared of their own people. The mass deportation of people from the Republic of Saha Yakutia was also a kind of an anti-war protest. After the mobilization was announced, miles long queues line up on the crossings with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Mongolia. In general, people moved. They started to live massively since the beginning of the war. Since last February, many people have moved out. All people who were kind of thinking got out in autumn, a great many people left in autumn. Together with my friend who lives in Kazakhstan, at the time of the announcement of mobilization, we opened a shelter for Yakuts to stay in. We organized free accommodation so that they could live there until they found permanent housing or decided where to go. Since then, roughly 8,000 people have gone to Kazakhstan, Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan. Now I think this number might have reached 10,000 and people continue moving out. Despite this, the authorities of the Russian Federation still continue to mobilize people and summons are sent through online service Gosuslugi. And that means any man aged 18 to 60 can be reached and then sent to war. The authorities are not even using the word mobilization these days. It is not said out loud at all. So it seems that there is no mobilization and yet the spring call started on the 1st of April. And right now, young men who did not serve, in particular students, are at risk. Generally, the mobilization never stopped. It was low intensity, but it still continued. The main difference between the mobilization today and then turned out to be just a great number of people. They need right now. Unfortunately, people tend to die in the war. Now the conscripts will completely effortlessly sign up the contracts and replace those mobilized militaries who were conscripted earlier. According to the statistics, 70% of the people who were killed during the war in Ukraine were from 18 to 24 years old. 70% of them. So it means that these are people who were passing the conscript service. It is impossible to give the exact number of the dead, 
but the dead are those who were confirmed dead. Besides this, we have the missing, and it is very hard to say the exact number. The real data is thoroughly hidden. All our regional publics turned out into the boards with obituaries. We have new posts like this every day. This is a question of the total extermination of our people. According to the data provided by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, the Russian army has already lost more than 185,000 of its soldiers and officers, most of them are representatives of indigenous colonized peoples from national republics that are currently parts and regions of the Russian Federation. Why aren't people from Moscow and St. Petersburg mobilized on the same scale that is being done in the regions? First of all, they're afraid of the uprising or some unrest among the residents of these cities, but they don't really care about the regions. For Moscow, Kremlin, Muscovy, just Russians. The name doesn't matter. The colonized peoples are used as cannon fodder against the peoples which had been colonized formally and have reason to defend their independence. This is a continuation of the same policy the Kremlin has been sticking to for 400 years. They kill, exterminate and enslave us. More than 190 peoples live on the territory of the Russian Federation. Most of them are indigenous peoples enslaved and colonized by Moscow in different periods of their history. So how the indigenous peoples of Sakha, Yakagirs, Evenki, Dogans turned out to be a part of Russia after all? They were providing us with such history and gave us such a version of history that we joined the empire due to our own desire. Meeting them with bread and salt, this is a lie. No voluntary entry ever happened. We can prove that with the amount of Saha, Evans, Evans nationalities left, there are few of us left because there was a very long resistance. We are colonies. They colonized us 400 years ago. At the beginning of the 17th century, the expansion of the Moscovites to the east continued and reached the banks of the Yenisei River. In 1619, in the Yenisei fort, the Tunguska prince told the Moscow people about the Yakuts, their rich lands and the large amounts of furs. An unquenchable thirst for enrichment pushed the greedy Moscovites for new conquests, and in 1620, the first expedition to the Lena River took place under the leadership of Pantelei Penda. This used to be fur, for which they came from Moscow, in order to sell it to Europe and become richer at our expense. In 1629, a new group of Yasak collectors from Moscow, under the leadership of Anton Dombrinsky, went to Vilu and Lena rivers and estuaries of the Alden. They were looting everything and everyone and they met on their way. Yakuts, Evans, Dolgans, Yakagirs weren't meeting them exactly with the open hearts and minds. This is the well-known fact about our population, has reduced twice since the arrival of Russians. In 1631, the new expedition ruled by Ivan Galkin, the Yenisei leader, occurred. He went down the Lena River to the Elden River and showed the local population all the delights of the so-called Russian world. Their men were slaughtering women, raping them, enslaving them and their children. Even there is a monument, shown as a monument to the mother, but in fact it is a monument to the bloody colonization and sexualization of our people. There is Abakayada, located right in the center of the city. She sits with a child and next to her is a Russian man. And this story is about how she was forcibly enslaved and in the slavery she bore him a child. Why did they call her Abakayada? It is because of the words she was saying, Ayaka and Abata. And Ayaka means it hurts, and Abata means it burns. And this, as far as I know, is a real historical fact. At the same time, another colonialist, Pertl Biketov, acted no less cruelly by suppressing the resistance of local residents. He built Lensky Fort, which later became Yakutsk. The so-called voluntary submission to him was the result of the burning of several Yakutian settlements and murder of hundreds of people. Why were these forts built? For mercenaries, similar to PMC Wagner in our days, to come there, for them to watch, take control and fight with the locals. They brutally dealt with uprisings, cruelty massacred with the locals, 
circles. And of course, that was going on for much longer than one year. The confrontation lasted for 100, 200 years. At the edge of the 17th and 18th centuries, the Muscovites built numerous forts on the Yakut lands that became the strongholds on the so-called Russian world and, in fact, served as military bases for control over the enslaved peoples. We had our own culture, our own lifestyle, everything was ours, dear to us, and we lived well. But in the end, Russian history says the Muscovites came there first. They were pioneers. Although, in fact, we were living there, so why are they pioneers? Having woken up from the first shock caused by the impudence and cruelty of the so-called highly virtuous conquerors, Yakuts rebelled to fight against the oppressors. In 1631, the indigenous peoples of Sakhar besieged the lines of Dobrinsky fort, the invaders fled, frightened by the Yakut's righteous anger. In 1632, the fighters for the freedom of Sakhar Yakuta, having gathered a detachment of a thousand horsemen, recaptured prey looted by the invaders of the Muscovites from the group of Ivan Galkin. At that time, we had trade relations with other regions of East Asia, Asia, the Siberian East, and the statehood started to form at that moment. At the end of February 1642, most of the Sakhai Yakut families rebelled against the colonialists. In 1682, Tayonjanik with his soldiers made several attempts to recapture Yakutsk, previously captured by Moscovites. However, unfortunately, the Yakut army was defeated by an army of professional mortars and murderers of the Moscow kingdom. Captured Yakuts were subjected to cruel torture and executions. The wounded Janik was taken prisoner in Yakutsk. He was killed and skinned alive, and his newborn child was wrapped by the executioners in the skin of his father. All this was done in front of the mother of the child, who, for heightened effect, was immediately hanged. All surviving warriors were executed by decapitation, as we see now. In the 21st century, the methods used by Muscovites 400 years ago are still popular amongst these people. They not only killed the detachments of the rebels during the suppression of uprisings, but also burned people alive. They could burn 80 people alive in one fort and 300 more people in another one. Sakhayakut kept resisting to the colonialists until 1684. However, the Muscovites still managed to completely occupy and enslave the indigenous peoples of the Sakha. There was a conquer, a capture, a forceful seizure, which were accompanied by numerous murders, suppression of rebellions, murders of leaders of the uprisings, and murders of their relatives, wives, children. At the beginning of the 20th century, during the collapse of the Russian Empire, the people of Sakha begins the fight. From 1921 to 1923, four powerful uprisings broke out aimed at the independence of the indigenous peoples and the cessation of the exploitation of the Yakut natural resources by the Russian state, as well as the creation of a government not dependent on Moscow. In 1921, due to the huge amount of effort made by our famous leader Amosov, Yakutia joined the Russian state as the autonomous Republic of Yakutia. In 1924, the rebels tried to leave the Soviet state as the autonomous Republic of Yakutia and join as the Federal Republic. But it did not happen and all of them were executed. 1928 was a year of big repressions. Punitive detachments were sent from Moscow. A huge number of people were shot. What was happening in the 20s of the last century echoed in the 1990s. We are the Republic of Saha Yakutia. We have already had a demo version of independence. We have have our own constitution, and when our first president, Mikhail Yefimovich Nikolaev, came after Yeltsin, has come to power, he came and declared sovereignty of the republic. Our own constitution appeared. They implemented a visa regime for some regions of Russia. The main part of income from the natural resources started following to the republic, and the republic began flourishing. So let's say that that was dawn of democracy, the democracy we organized inside Russia. It was a state with in a state. Мы столько сегодня дали прав Якутии и Саха, пусть 
It was at the time when we started to develop international relations with other countries, bypassing Moscow, without agreeing on that with Moscow. At that moment, we had the greatest rise in national self-consciousness. We started to build national schools, print and publish books in the national language. In general, the growth of the national culture took place immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, we had some piece of sovereignty, but everything went wrong. It should have been done in another way. We had to leave. We had to support Ichkiria. We had to somehow unite forces. In my opinion, if we had been together with Chechnya, Tatarstan, because we are one of the largest territorial formations, if we had agreed, our rulers had agreed, I think Moscow would not simply have had enough power to start the war against three republics. But now all of us recall this time, of course, with nostalgia. People know, as I said, we had this this demo version, we know perfectly well how to live in a democracy. We know what it means to live in a democratic state. It doesn't matter that people are silent now, pretend to be silent, but they all remember because it was not much time ago. But after Putin came to power, they quietly started to take everything away. <laughs> We lost everything – our sovereignty, oil, coal, gas. All these sources belong to Moscow right now. If you pay attention to the numbers, there are several telling examples. In 2021, 17 million tons of oil and 13 billion cubic meters of natural gas were extracted in the Republic of Saha. In 2021, they produced 42 tons of gold and 31 million tons of coal, as well as 168 tons of silver. This is a huge income that goes to Moscow. Moscow lives at the expense of us. This is a fact no one even doubts in this. And the residents also understand this, because they see that we have partially comfortable houses, we have wooden foundations, and housing in a state of emergency, buckets we need to take out. I'm sorry for these details, but my mother lives in the apartment, and there is no toilet inside. However, in the connection to my people, we managed to preserve a significant part of our culture the antiquity of the language itself. But using the example of the national language, in 2018 changes were made to the federal law of education, precisely in the paragraph with regards to national languages. All national languages do not have to be necessarily studied under the conditions of the policy that is being pursued by the federal government. For example, according to some studies, it is believed that the Yakut language is in danger of disappearing already in 2050. It is not taught at schools. It goes as an optional subject, not to mention the representatives of the small peoples of the north, to whom I belong, have dead languages. The Yukagir language is dead. It is spoken by only a few people. The Republic of Saha is not monocultural. On the territory of the Republic, there are about 400,000 representatives of Saha, 30,000 representatives of small peoples of the north, and their condition is of course worse than that is of the representatives of Saha who have retained their language culture. Considering such a state of affairs and the protest moods in the Republic, it has always been quite threatening for Moscow. Moscow is afraid of any manifestations of protests. It's enough to recall the story of Yakut shaman Alexander Gabashev when the Moscow authorities were seriously afraid of just one single person. Не человек, брат, перед нами демон. С ним справится с демоном только шаман, воин. Якутская мифология – эпос Олонхо. Due to the Yakut mythology, our epos, Olonkho, the world is divided into three parts. This is the upper world, where the supreme deities live, the middle world, where we live, and the lower world of Abaga, so those people who have been captured by Abaga can be freed if there is a hero that is ready to kill this demon. 
Once they defeat this evil spirit, the captured people become free and can live in peace in the middle world. People like the thesis that the power of the state must be theirs, that they have to get back democracy and ability to speak up, to decide what is going to happen in their country and what is not. Why did people start following him? It is obvious. He is telling the truth. He is speaking up that the people should have power over their own country. He says that we are the people so that we are the power. In the end, Putin got ill for several hours and the authorities decided that they dealt with a distant blow from Gorbachev. Because of this, he was immediately detained. Despite the criminal prosecution and the danger of arrest, Alexander Gorbachev continued his fight against the Putin regime. If you see this report, it means that I am a member of dictator Putin. Listen to the orders. I ask you to start the fighting against the dictator Putin. On the 12th of May, the whole detachment of riot police bursts into his house. The detention of the Yakut shaman reminded more of a special operation to neutralize a dangerous armed terrorist. Everyone saw these terrible shots when the security forces, 20 of them, broke into his house in the middle of winter, grabbed him. The court decided to send him for compulsory treatment to a psychiatric hospital. I think this is a punitive psychiatry that was a common thing for the USSR. Понятно, что за ситуация. Понятно, что этому человеку здесь абсолютно не место. Он должен быть на свободе и без всяких там условий и разговоров и так далее и никакого лечения не нужно. Я считаю, что Путин. I think that Putin believes in the power of shamans. He is a pagan himself. Even if you look at the situation 400 years ago and earlier, the Russians tried to exterminate shamans because they were afraid of their strength. Почему Путин испугался его? Why was Putin afraid of him? He was afraid that they indeed would reach Moscow. The simple people with understandable requirements, they would come, they would come to Red Square and people would follow them. Can you imagine that having full war censorship, repressions yet to come? These people pick up their courage to continue fighting. This fight can be different. The most important thing about this fight and resistance is its longevity. It is important not to stop. All the oppositional forces stand for the same. They want the people and nation in general to understand on their own what they need and want, which decisions to make and how to live further. All of them want Yakutia to gain independence and become an independent state. full-scale invasion of sovereign Ukraine by the Russian Federation on February 24, 2022 made the whole world shudder. Many countries began to rethink their own security strategies, joining in military alliances, revising their defense budgets and also certain processes began to occur in the Russian Federation itself. Many opposition politicians, public figures, activists, representatives of various peoples began to think about the security and the future of their own people, organizations such as the League of Free Nations appeared. Everything that the League of Free Nations conducts we sign. We sign up all these manifests, appeals and other documents. One day all of them will become a part of history and we agree with every word said by the League of Nations there. As well as the League of Free Nations, the Free People's Forum was organized by indigenous peoples of Russia, which goal is the decolonization of the Russian Federation. Now. I understand that Mrs. Raisa Zubareva Saka is available on remote connection. 
Мы говорим о том, We are saying that there was no voluntary entry into the Russian Empire. We are talking about the fact that our land, as well as our people, were seized by means of violence against the free will of the people living in those territories. We demand justice to be restored at every event. The representatives of Saha were present at the very first forum. They took part in the second one, in the third, and will take part in the upcoming one in April. They will also have a word to say. To put it bluntly, the lands of the Russian Federation are just small pieces. Everything else is not theirs. It is alien. We are entering the international arena. We participate in various events. We participated in the Congress in Berlin in order to be heard not only in Russia, but it is important for us to be heard in Ukraine, to be heard abroad, that peoples in the regions are against the war. We did not choose this war. We did not vote for it. The Free Equity Fund also emerged, which opposes the criminal war that Putin unleashed and works for the independence of the Republic of Sakha. This fund is a voice of indigenous peoples. We work closely with other national republics. We understand that strength is in unity. There are few of us, therefore we unite. We create various organizations, support each other, and in the future we will be a very powerful force. When the war finishes, we will enter the most interesting part of the fight for us personally. So that's why we are getting ready. The representatives of the indigenous peoples set up the paramilitary battalion of the Republic of Sakha, which went over to the Ukrainian side. I am going to fight for Ukraine, not only because of their independence, but for our freedom as well. I encourage you to join us. Ukraine will give us the opportunity to fight in their ranks for the freedom of Ukraine and our independence. There will not be a second chance like this. Join us. We will teach you and give you the golden opportunity to bring freedom to your country. I summon everyone to join in our ranks of armed resistance. Everyone, men, women, of all the people living in the territory of the Republic of Saha, representatives of the LGBTQ community, and together we will bring back independence and democracy to our homes. I agree only on the decolonization of Russia, no federalization. I want Russia to fall apart because the Republic of Saha will never develop within Russia. All our sources are being spent on the development of Muscovy. Now there is a civil council that makes it possible for everyone on the territory of the Russian Federation to go through Kazakhstan and Turkey and to get to Ukraine, undergo training, get equipment and join the ranks of the Ukrainian army. Independence of Yakutia is a common dream for every Yakut intellectual. I even remember hearing these words in my childhood. We know that Yakutia must be independent. As long as this state of the Russian Empire exists, the bandit state exists, the war will continue. People mean nothing for the Empire. For a normal democratic state, this is the main value. And as soon as we understand that we can be free, that we can separate from Russia, that we can live on our own, this war will end. We will create the future Yakut elite, those people who are ready to fight and stand for our freedom and independence. I would like to speak to the residents of the Republic of Saha, a multinational republic. I would like to say that the war in Ukraine will come to everyone in the nearest time or a little bit later, but it will be connected to you. So it's time you made a choice. Choose the side of the good. Save yourself for the future fight with the regime. We are supposed to go through difficult times. Get ready. This time is coming and in the end we will be free. The future of a nation depends on the actions made by every single person right now, every Saha, every Yakut.